Morning friends and welcome to this special briefing on the state visit of His Highness General Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces, who as you know is going to be the chief guest at our Republic Day Parade uh, day after tomorrow. He is arriving uh, late this evening today and we expect very substantive outcomes from this very important visit. So to brief you on that, I have with me Secretary Economic Relations, Shri Amar Sinha, as well as our Ambassador to the UAE, Shri Navdeep Suri. Secretary ER will give you the overall picture uh, through a comprehensive opening statement, and thereafter uh, our Ambassador to UAE would also be able to supplement once in, ca uh, in case you have any questions. So with that, I give the floor to Secretary ER. Thank you and good morning. Uh, I guess a lot has already been written in the media about this visit, so I don't know how much we can add. But uh, what I'll do is give you an overview of the program, which is uh, fairly simple and standard in a way. Uh, also, a little bit of background uh, and the major outcomes that we are expecting. Uh, so you know that he will arrive today, uh, mid-evening, around 4.30, his arrival. He's coming with a large delegation. Uh, number of ministers and a large number of businessmen also. Uh, of course, the business part and the economy minister would also be participating besides the events in Delhi. We'll also go to Vishakhapatnam for the CII's partnership summit uh, on 27th and 28th. I think they're there on 27th. Uh, we'll be participating with the business delegation. Uh, here the drill is, well, tomorrow he'll be received. Tomorrow is the official day of visit, 25th, so he'll be received. Uh, at the forecourt, Rashpati Bhavan, then he goes to Rajghat, then he goes for a one-to-one uh, -one meeting with the Prime Minister at uh, Lok Kalyan Marg now. Uh, after that is the delegation level talks at Hyderabad House, where Prime Minister and the Cabinet uh, would be there. Prime Minister would be hosting a banquet lunch for him uh, tomorrow, followed by the usual press statements uh, and I think uh, uh, exchange of agreements. In the afternoon tomorrow, then he meets, uh, the vice president will uh, meet him. Uh, and then in the evening, he calls on the president and there's a banquet hosted by our president. That's for tomorrow. Day after, as he has said, that he's uh, the chief guest for 26th January uh, celebrations. So besides witnessing the parade, where we are actually getting a contingent from the UAE Air Force also, which will be parading along with our forces on Rajpath. Uh, he will also attend the at-home function uh, in the afternoon hosted by uh, our president, and from where he departs actually for UAE and the rest of the delegation, which stays on for Vizag. Uh, needless to add, UAE has seen intense activities and engagement over the last, uh, since August 2015. Uh, both the leader ha leaders have invested a lot of personal time and energy, and this is actually the, uh, you can see the chemistry and the warmth of the rapport that has developed between them, uh, and uh, and of course from India's perspective, UAE remains one of our key partners in the Gulf. I guess uh, there can't be no other better explanation that we had to pull out one of our top diplomats and the brightest diplomats to come and serve as ambassador in UAE. That's a testimony to uh, how we look at this relationship and nurturing this relationship. Uh, as you know, Prime Minister visited UAE in August 2015. Uh, it was followed by a uh, visit by the Crown Prince here in February 2016. And then less than a year, he's here as the chief guest. So that itself shows that we are paying a lot of attention. And basically, because it's driven by four key factors, which I would call the pillars of uh, our relationship. First is trade and commerce. Uh, UAE remains one of our major partners. Last year the numbers were an impressive 50 billion dollars. Uh, plus it is a gateway for a lot of our exports to Africa and to Central Asia, etc. Uh, then of course is investment. Uh, UAE also has the largest sovereign wealth fund. We are looking at investments. There's an agreement that they would invest nearly 75 uh, billion dollars in India over the last, over the next uh, couple of years. And during the visit, we are hoping that there will be an MOU signed between uh, their investment uh, fund and what we have, what we call the NIIF, 
National Investment Infrastructure or in Infrastructure Investment Fund that we have created on our side. So that's uh, at an advanced stage. The second element, of course, is obvious energy security. Uh, which is the big pillar, which is the fifth largest exporter of oil, and we foresee that it will remain as a key partner. We are adding a new element to this relationship of just being a buyer, that UAE has decided to become a strategic partner in the energy sector and will be well, both investing and filling up one of our key strategic uh, petroleum reserves. Uh, we hope that the negotiations would conclude today. Uh, and the uh, last few I issues are remaining, and we would be able to sign an MOU on that. Third is, of course, welfare of the Indian community. 2.6 million people there. Uh, it is uh, a very, very important destination for Indian workers, both blue-collar, white-collar, uh, Indian investments, uh, and, and also people investing actually in real estate in Dubai. These are all huge areas of cooperation. In this, um, uh, a good outcome of the last visit has been that they have decided that Abu Dhabi has provided land for a temple for the community, and the community committee is taking that uh, thing forward. Then, of course, defense and security is emerging as a new area of cooperation. Here, of course, it's based on shared views, concerns about uh, common threats. Uh, so we are hoping that this visit would solidified some of the ideas that the governments have worked on, and uh, you will see substantial results uh, at the end of the visit in this area of security and defense. Uh, in terms of the outcomes, see, we already had, the decision was taken that we will have, we will sort of raise our relationship to a strategic partnership uh, level. However, we are still signing an agreement which is called, which is more like an action plan which fleshes out the idea of strategic partnership and, and brings in concrete ideas what the two sides are committed to doing. Besides this, there would be, of course, a joint statement uh, that will be issued uh, which would give the vision of the two leaders on how they look at this relationship evolving over the years. Uh, I also mentioned that there would be an MOU on NIIF uh, and uh, investment authorities there would be most probably an agreement on strategic partnership in oil, oil sector. Uh, then we will have an MOU in defense, particularly focused on joint manufacturing, uh, purchase of equipment. Uh, we, of course, are looking for markets as our defense industry expands, but importantly, UAE is also looking for dependable partners, partners who can actually provide them equipment without conditionalities and also supply it when they need it the most. So that is that reliability and stability of the partnership is something that they are looking for in India uh, and we also feel that UAE will remain a very very critical partner for us in the future. Uh, then there are a host of other besides uh, energy security there is something else on uh, predictability of trade remedies. We are doing an MOU uh, with commerce and their investigating authorities so that the products that we exchange between each other have a certain predictable legal framework and when anti-subsidy or anti-dumping uh, investigations happen, there would be closer cooperation, exchange of views, and importantly, before we go into uh, this quasi-judicial sort of uh, uh, path, uh, if we could find sort of mutually acceptable remedies even before that. So that is another key request that we had. Uh, for the diplomats, they, we are looking at uh, having an exemption in terms of visa exemption for diplomatic and, pass, uh, and official and special passport holders. Uh, then we are also looking at an MOU on maritime transport. Now this is key because uh, one, of the, one of the main objectives we have been uh, sort of following is to somehow increase this people-to-people -people contact, increase tourism. And we are really looking at working on uh, developing cruise tourism between the west coast of India uh, and UAE and some of the other destinations in the Gulf. Uh, then there would be a co uh, bilateral cooperation in land transport. But I won't go through the list because you will have this tomorrow. So I think I would stop here and we will take questions unless uh, our ambassador wishes to add something else. I may add that uh, as a preparation, we had the first strategic dialogue headed by 
their Minister of State, Mr. Gargash, and our own MOS, MG Akbar, on 20th, we, we discussed various elements of the strategic partnership and the nuts and bolts of our relationship. Thank you. Floor is now open for questions. Manish. Uh, sir, the Prime Minister UAE went there. Then this story that 75 billion dollars UAE invest will do in India. Mein. डेढ़ साल करीब बीत चुके हैं तो क्या स्टेटस है कितना इन्वेस्टमेंट आया अब तक देखिए अब अभी तक तो उनका करीब चार बिलियन डॉलर है ऑलरेडी इन्वेस्टेड और बहुत सारी कंपनियां हैं जैसे एमआर है यू सी व्हेन वी आर टॉकिंग द सेवेंटी फाइव बिलियन वी आर लॉकिंग एट द सॉवरेन इन्वेस्टमेंट फंड बिसाइज दिस दे मेजर कंपनीज विच हैव इन्वेस्टेड डी पी वर्ल्ड फॉर एग्जाम्पल इज अ मेजर इन्वेस्टर इन इंडिया एम आर इज अ मेजर इन्वेस्टर इन इंडिया Uh, then Eti Salat had invested here. Of course, some of these have some legacy issues, which also we are looking at uh, resolving, so that uh, they have that level of confidence in the Indian economy. And the fact is that they are looking at both portfolio investments as well as investments in greenfield. Uh, they are also looking at uh, upstream uh, and downstream industry in uh, in petroleum sector. That they are negotiating not with the government but with some private uh, companies which are willing to sell. Will you add? Yeah, if I can just add on that, uh, uh, as Secretary said, that uh, the $75 billion figure really refers to investment by some of their sovereign wealth funds in Indian infrastructure. But if you go beyond that, there are two major categories of UAE investments that have taken place in India. Dubai Holdings, for example, is the main partner for the Kochi Smart City, and that smart city is coming up first as one of the most ambitious uh, projects of its kind. There's another company from UAE which has invested uh, significantly in Chennai. Uh, it's called KEF Infrastructure to establish an entire prefabricated structures facility. So when you talk about affordable housing or hospitals or schools, they will do all the, they're already manufacturing pre prefabricated structures in India. Even their sovereign wealth funds, RDA, for example, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, has invested in the last uh, year over half a billion dollars into Indian green energy companies. Um, they have invested into real estate uh, uh, companies. So there is a lot of other investment action that is taking place beyond uh, what that big ticket uh, item is. Um, just just to, uh, one more point to Advocas is that in addition, the new trend that we are seeing is some of the best established NRI companies in UAE have also started to invest in a very significant way in India, and that's a sign of their increased business confidence in India. The Lulu Group, for example, has established India's hi biggest hypermarket in Kochi, and they're setting up a second one in uh, Tiruvananthapuram. The NMC Group is establishing hospitals in India, as is the Universal uh, Hospitals Group. So whether it's in real estate sector, in retail sector, in, in, in some even in manufacturing, you see that some of the big NRI-owned companies out of Dubai and Abu Dhabi are also putting money into India. Parikshit. So over the last few weeks, there have been uh, talks about India wanting UAE to seize properties of Daud Ibrahim on uh, their soil. Have there been any developments on that front, especially when that strategic dialogue took place? You want us to alert everybody and uh, that they move their properties and their titles underground. I think best is it's left unsaid till something happens. This was answered by MOS uh, MJ Akbar also at the press conference, where we said we do not discuss specific cases in the public domain. And that's how it will remain. So, Hassani. Uh, one clarification, one question. When you say $75 billion, you said $4 billion has already come in. This is not part of the $75 no, billion. No. Because from what we understand from UAE officials, the $75 billion sovereign wealth fund hasn't even been set up yet. It has only been announced a year and a half ago. It hasn't been set up yet. Yeah, the MOU is being finalized now with NIIF. You see, there were, because NIIF itself didn't have an administrative structure. That came up only a couple of months ago. CEO and since then, the CEO has been to uh, Abu Dhabi. They have uh, talked to each other. They have exchanged an MOU. We are hoping that they'll sign it. All right. And the, the question was about um, in, uh, uh, India, UAE uh, strategic partnership when it comes to um, counter-terrorism forces. Has the UAE asked India about joining forces in any way to counter terror, particularly the ISIS threat? 
um, in, in the Middle East, uh, the coalition that the UAE is already part of. Are we looking at any kind of joint uh, partnership over there? That, of course, coalition of th 34 or 39 that they have, I don't think uh, that has ever been raised with India. Uh, and I don't think they will be ever raised. Yeah. Yes. But yes, a general cooperation in terms of intelligence sharing, specific action against others. And I think the Kandahar incident recently uh, perhaps had uh, brought home the fact that the threat is very common, that UA diplomats also got killed. So that is also something that would be an issue that would be discussed here. Dr. Thank you, Mr. Vikas. Uh, Mr. Sinha, is this uh, kind of security arrangement and defense arrangement in the Gulf state, because you have a stake hold in the, uh, in, in the uh, event of uh, any eventuality happening there. Is there any visionary from Indian side how to see the stability and security maintained in, in, in this part of the world where you can safeguard your own interest as well and the region? Well, we will be working with them both, as I said, in intelligence sharing, that's on specific terrorist threats, but besides on a larger security issue in terms of their air defense capabilities, uh, their uh, uh, patrolling uh, anti-piracy and uh, maritime security, uh, cyber security, because ultimately the largest threat emerges from the radicalization and online radicalization that is happening. But given the policies, we don't see UAE as, uh, as a society which is veering towards radicalization. In fact, the policies are exactly the opposite. And uh, obviously our discussions will focus on what else we need to do uh, to insulate ourselves from this uh, virus. So you mentioned about the defense MOU. Can you please elaborate about the, the what are the products we are looking at uh, selling to, to UAE and what kind of defense uh, you know, uh, manufacturing and production uh, arrangement we are looking at? Going into details, but obviously we are looking at armaments, we are looking at armored person carriers, uh, we are looking at joint production of aircrafts because, uh, for example, to give you an example, uh, well, I'm not saying that it's concrete, but Rafael is an aircraft which uh, we are buying, UAE also uses. So there is this interest that is there something that we can do together in terms of the portion of the Rafael that would be built in India. So those are the areas we are trying to sort of identify and work together. So some weeks ago, uh, a delegation of the DRDO uh, had gone to the UAE and this was dis uh, on discussing the um, possibility of selling the BrahMos missile uh, there. Could you tell us uh, what has happened on that? And also, uh, so on the Indian sailors who are stuck in England, if you could tell This is a briefing, Srinjoy, how many times do I have to say? This is a briefing on the visit of the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, not on, it's not my regular weekly briefing. The discussions have happened. Uh, I don't have the exact details. Uh, but we are also looking at uh, products which have been designed and developed in India. Because, as you know, uh, it becomes easier to export it. So. Correct. Half Indian. We would focus on full Indian yeah. to begin with. At you the see, back. it's a question of who holds the IPR. Uh, so if it, is a, it becomes a trilateral or a quadrilateral, it becomes slightly more difficult and since more countries are involved. Uh, but there are products which India has developed and there are several. Elizabeth. Uh, sir, I just wanted to know about this MOU uh, between the Sovereign Wealth Fund and the NIIF. Um, the MOU that's going to be initial tomorrow, hopefully, is going to um, uh, obviously pave the way. But does that establish the structure for, um, you know, the governance structure? Or, I mean, uh, could you just give us any details about this, if possible? Um, <coughs> look, the issue of the uh, arrangement with NIIF has been under very active discussion. Um, this. It's taken us a while to establish an IAF. It's taken us a while to appoint a CEO, which only happened last September. Look at his team today. It's hardly five or six people. It's going to take a while before NIIF, as the big umbrella body, which will do serious investments in infrastructure, 
really has that capacity to absorb significant amount of funds and be in a position to invest. We see Abu Dhabi Investment Authority as a crucial partner with NIIF. It's going to take a while to have that mechanism in place, the capacity in place to invest big time in major projects. What I can tell you coming from Abu Dhabi is there's very strong interest from RDA in working with NIIF as the vehicle uh, and to follow up on the conversations that we are, have been having and will be having tomorrow. Uh, RDA have already told us that they are sending a really top level team in the end of February with several of the sectoral heads, their executive directors, to look at particular opportunities. I see this as a work in process. I don't see it as an event that happens at a point of time. So uh, you'll have broad umbrella arrangements, but the specifics of that $75 billion flowing through NIIF into ports, highways, airports, uh, renewable energy, or other sectors is going to take a while. And for that, we have to have large, commercially viable, credible projects that we can offer to investors. So there's work to be done yet. MOU will provide the framework, you know, between NIIF and, you know, for the modalities actually to be worked out and for the uh, funds to start getting processed. Uh, and he also wants add, to add while, a little bit. While the MOU will also create the administrative structure, how that fund would be sort of administered uh, jointly. Uh, but without waiting for that, we have actually in October, uh, when we had the economic forum uh, meeting, we did make sectoral presentations, both on railways and uh, highways. And we had identified, I think, five or six projects each, which is ripe for investment even without the NIF route. So that is a call that they have to take, that where they would wish to uh, invest. But let me also add that we are also looking at new areas, you know, besides the four traditional sort of uh, pillars that I mentioned. Uh, of course, defense and security would be enhanced substantially. Uh, but we are also looking at space cooperation, where there's a great interest. Uh, we are looking at civil nuclear energy cooperation, and of course, greater uh, cooperation in IT and IT services. So these will be the three new focus areas uh, from our perspective. Naz. Um, you, you said uh, the, the two countries are having a strategic partnership in energy security. So what is else, what else besides the, what is going on at present, uh, what in future is going to happen in this sector? No, I think Secretary was very categorical. He said that UAE is the fifth largest supplier of crude oil to us. They are going to be investing in one of our strategic oil reserves. Uh, you know, we have several uh, locations. One of the locations, I think, they are, they'll be our partners. And then that will contribute to overall India's energy security. So I think that's fairly clear. So for long, UAE has been considered as a very close friend of Pakistan. What are the factors that uh, seem that have resulted in UAE seeming to move towards India and away from Pakistan? And there's a school of thought that Saudi Arabia and UAE are moving closer to India because uh, the Pakistan army refused to participate in the campaign in Yemen. So do you lend credence to this? And uh, so what are the factors basically that, see, that we have seen that they have moved closer to us and away from the Pakistan? I would like to speculate on uh, factors that affect UAE's relations with other countries. Of course, they are uh, they're all driven by the dynamics and, and the realities. Uh, I can, what I can talk to you is about why India is a preferred destination or, or as a partner. And I think the answers are obvious. Uh, they realize the potential of the Indian economy. Uh, Indians form the largest expatriate group, which has not only contributed, but has been extremely peaceful and very well sort of adjusted uh, to the society. So it has some education, health care, these are all important destinations for UAE and the other Gulf countries, they come to India. I don't know whether that's going to Pakistan. Now whether uh, it's a conscious move or it's a natural, I think, uh, sort of progression of relationship given the dynamics of the region. Uh, I will leave it for you to speculate. Yeah. Sir, you talked about legacy issue of uh, big investments of UAE. Uh, what are the specific demands from UAE and how India is going to solve this 
Is there any time frame for this? Well, specific demand is that uh, we resolve these issues quickly. Uh, that's a nutshell. It has taken time because we are unable to predict. These are not uh, executive decisions. These are all issues which are sub judice, where in different courts. Uh, so we are trying to see whether we can sort of ring fence some of their investors without diluting the main cases because there are people who are involved, there are Indians also who are involved in these cases. So we don't want to, government doesn't want to do anything which sort of dilutes the overall case. But given that restriction and the fact that our judiciary uh, will have to, I think, work with them so that we have early resolution of these cases. Um, if I can just, uh, Amar, uh, if I can just to that, that in, uh, in several cases uh, we have uh, made tangible progress. Uh, several of the so-called legacy cases have been resolved by the high-level task force that was established after the last visit. And the uh, friends in UAE acknowledge the progress that has been made in the last several months in resolving some long-standing cases. I don't see any other questions, so this press conference comes to a close. Just a reminder that at 4 o'clock we'll have uh, another press conference which will be addressed by MOS General VK Singh and MOS Post's Sri Manoj Sinha on the integration of the Passport Saver Project with post offices, which is also, I think, is going to be a revolutionary step in making passports easier to obtain uh, for ordinary Indian citizens. So do come for that one as well. Thank you all.